just in terms of some quick learning objectives, I'm kind of hoping by the end of this, you guys understand what I mean by Kubernetes policy in terms of termino terminology. Why should you care about Kubernetes policy? And then how to apply your organization governance to controls to these different environments. A lot of organizations have their own security controls. They brought these things from on-prem. How can I start to apply some of those? Knowing again, it's not a one size fits all. Like Albert talked about, getting dirty with APIs and getting development uh, is kind of a way of life now with respect to security and cloud. So in terms of the agenda, it's gonna be kind of short and sweet. So do I care about container security? Uh, what is Kubernetes policy? And then we'll see Kubernetes policy in action. And then we'll wrap up with a quick summary. So why should we actually care about container security? Uh, so cloud native, again, is a hot topic. Kubernetes and containers is a hot topic. Kubernetes was the first project inside the CNCF or cloud native compute. This on, as opposed to taking a lot of what we did on-prem in terms of building applications, how do I essentially, if I could kind of wipe the slate and start new, that to me is really what cloud native is all about. So a lot of these tools that are inside the CNCF are built from the ground up and they're cloud first. They weren't taking something from on-prem and porting it over. Combine that now with governance and security is a hot topic, again, in cloud. So again, folks are trying to figure out how do I take some of those same practices, uh, some of that DevOps culture from on-prem and how do I bring that to cloud? Security is top of mind for many organizations. And then the reality is I think that's forcing a lot of organizations into using containers and Kubernetes as development teams. So developers are really looking at containers as a new way of doing development, a new way to bin pack or package up an application or utilities or anything else. And then the idea here is obviously we're bringing the containers and Kubernetes, it's not going away. Looking from a CISO perspective, so what I hear from chatting with a lot, even though I focus a lot on cloud native applications, I do talk to a lot of financial services, organizations, insurance ag agencies, a lot of highly regulated industries, like talk across a wide variety of industries as well. And security is always the biggest concern when it comes to doing a container strategy. Or an organization are going, this is new, it's not something they're used to doing today. How do I start to bring some of these controls and that in place? A lot of the traditional security controls don't apply. So we really moved from that static world of IP addressing to a more dynamic world. So just to give a quick example of that, in Kubernetes, when I define a workload, which is kind of like a container inside of a pod, pod's the smallest deployment unit. When I go to uh, roll out that application and inside that pod, it gets one IP address. That IP address might change and morph over time. So if I scale that, I delete that particular pod, I re-roll that back out, IPs are constantly changing. So we have a pool of IP addresses. So that's a big change essentially for a lot of folks that are used to that static world. A lot of questions I get around security controls. I'm used to my firewall, IPS, intrusion detection software. How do I bring that or can I do that inside of a Kubernetes cluster as an example? There's not the same kind of segregation you have between the VMs, the different DMZ zones and different layers we've got today. So again, how do I start to take advantage or what should I be looking at to get some of those same controls in place? And again, uh, Albert just talked about, we wanna have reactive-based security or we wanna move away from reactive-based security to be proactive. And I think that's really what we're looking at here when we talk about Kubernetes policy. So we need that ability to shift left, how can I move things closer towards where things are actually happening? So I want to detect things up front versus after the fact. In reality, just for a quick picture, kind of showing that. So before, what we've done in the past, we have a pipeline up top and we embed so many controls, we have so much implementation inside there. What it really makes it hard to do is every time I bring on a new application or I need to roll out a new service, I'm constantly making a lot of changes to my pipeline. Really what we're looking at from a governance perspective is more that after picture. What if I can actually make this a lot easier? What if I can put policy in place so that regardless of what happens, so whether I come in through automation, whether I come in through a command line, whether I come in through even from a malicious code perspective, as an example, how can I actually detect what these things are going on and block them up front? So again, that's shifting left. So we kind of understand why this is such a hot topic. So let's get into what is Kubernetes policy. Um, so for those folks that don't know, when I look at this piece on top here, this is a Kubernetes admission controller pipeline, basically meaning every request that comes into Kubernetes from the left-hand side here, you'll hear the term API server in that world, goes through a whole authentication authorization process. And then it goes through two particular webhooks here. There's this mutating admission webhook, 
And then there's this validating admission webhook. This is our chance to interject into this controller pipeline to be able to implement our particular policy. So it could be something as simple as, I wanna make sure that no containers are running as root, as an example. So I could actually block that right up front in the pipeline versus having it get through, getting it deployed, and then capturing it after the fact. So how is this done today? It's done with dynamic admission control. And I'm gonna go through these essentially in great detail. I'm just kind of skip these over, but we got that validating webhook and mutating webhook. Think of this as the ability today, when I go to do that in interjection, I have to write code. So I intercept some traffic, I go and opt over to my service. My service then uh, basically validates that schema, looks at the schema, that metadata, makes determination on whether something can proceed, whether something can't proceed, whether I need to morph something as an example and then I essentially send it back on. And that's where the interjection happens. We call that interception process, that dynamic admission control. So that sounds awesome, but what's the challenge with actually writing that dynamic admission control? So the big challenge here, if we look at in today's world, it takes about roughly 200 lines of code to run, write one simple check. So this is one validation check, one mutating check. So that's a lot of, you can imagine as an organization where I'm gonna have hundreds and hundreds of controls I need to implement. That's literally thousands and tens of thousands of lines of code that I need to manage and maintain. So that's incurring organizations, that's incurring a lot of technical debt for organizations. So maybe, like, is there a better way? Is there some way they don't have to manage and maintain all this technical debt? This is where we get into Kubernetes policy around what we call open policy agents. You can think of open policy agent as essentially a standard. So again, it's a CNCF project general purpose policy enforcement engine. So again, it's not necessarily specific to Kubernetes, but this is the underlying specification that we're, that's driving the Kubernetes policy is this open policy agent. And it's a declarative policy language based on Rego. So it's R-E-G-O, Rego, Rego. It's essentially a scripting language. And we'll have a quick look at that in a follow-up slide. But think of this as a way, instead of having to write code, I can actually define things through a templating language or a scripting language. So a predefined language that's a lot easier for the large majority of organizations to manage and maintain or even to learn versus having to write code and manage all that technical debt. So the good, the bad, and the gotchas. The good, so it allows you to decouple your policy from your applications. Again, um, in that pipeline example that we showed, every time I'm actually tying things tightly into my pipeline, uh, it'd be, Nice if I could actually decouple that. So regardless of what, like I said, I'm coming through a pipeline or somebody uses a command line tool or somebody comes in through a back door, remember that we have that admission control pipeline. Everything essentially gets intercepted inside there. So what if I can actually deny stuff regardless of the channel it's coming through? So the bad, I mean, just like anything else, there's a learning curve to Rego. So again, I, it's something else that I need to learn. I, knew, I do hear that a lot from organizations. Another tool in the tool belt, thinking from a Batman perspective, something else I have to learn. I have to learn how to use it. I have to get really good at it. And I have to know the kind of the limitations around it. Some of the gotchas uh, here around, if I have the ability to mutate objects, that needs to be handled with care. So as you can imagine, if I've got source control, like Albert was actually talking about, where we want to drive these things to, just like we have infrastructure as code, we want to drive things into source control. If my source control says one thing, and my policy is actually mutating objects, and the end result in my runtime is something slightly different, then I've mutated something, and now my source control doesn't map what's actually running. So I always kind of say use the mutating stuff with caution. So I've called it Kubernetes policy controller, but really what this has done is it's moved to the CNCF underneath the security and compliance umbrella. It's now called OPA gatekeeper. So OPA again is that um, uh, general purpose policy agent. Gatekeeper is the specific implementation of OPA for Kubernetes. So again, just think of when you hear, if you hear OPA gatekeeper or you hear Kubernetes policy, they're kind of one in the same, but the new terminology around it is OPA gatekeeper. The other nice thing it does from a policy perspective, you can just like other things, I can make a hard deny on stuff or I can actually audit. So I can put a policy in place that simply audits what's actually in my environment. And then I can grab that auditing information from my particular logs. So again, just to kind of quickly recap, Kubernetes policy controller is based on OPA gatekeeper and then Rego is that policy language. Really what it's used to do is it's used to intercept in that API server admission control pipeline. So it allows me that hook, so to speak, or a web hook in there to be able to apply policy regardless of what's actually coming through. 
Okay, let's just have a look at this in action. So Kubernetes policy in action. We'll kind of quickly think about this from a couple of different perspectives. So I've got an admin, he adds policy to the cluster. So again, I'm defining my rule. The example I'm gonna go through here right away is around allowed registries. So again, um, the way containers work is they get stored in a registry and then Kubernetes pulls from that registry, pulls those images down the images or the containers that get started up in those pods inside that world. So in this kind of idea here, a lot of organizations just simply, they want to block public registries as a quick example, or I want to make sure that production only pulls from the production registry versus the developer registry. And even if I want to get more granular than that for particular namespaces inside a Kubernetes environment, I want to make sure that this namespace can only pull from this registry, or can only pull these tagged or named images. So it becomes actually really important, I kind of call it garbage in, garbage out, if I can help control what's actually getting pulled into my cluster. So you can imagine somebody does something malicious and wants to pull down a container from somewhere. It has to be in that allowed registry. So if that's something you have control over, you're allowed to essentially put those particular rules in place. So I can't just pull an image from anywhere. So once the admin actually applies that particular policy, and then what happens is goes to the actual process. Now any request that's coming through, if that matches the policy, so it might be a simple policy is to say, okay, any request coming through for a Kubernetes type pod or deployment, I want to evaluate against this particular policy. So in this case, it's gonna evaluate against an allowed list of registries to say, okay, is the image that's associated with that pod or that deployment in this allowed list of registries? If it is, let it come through and deploy onto the cluster, Kubernetes cluster. If not, I'm going to reject it, and that whole request is going to get rejected. So let's essentially think of that as, like I said, two parts. I'm applying a template, I'm applying a constraint, and then at runtime, things are going through that admission control pipeline and figuring out whether that watching process needs to essentially adhere to that rule coming through. Just an example, Rego policy here. So you can see this is a deny. What this is actually looking at here is it's looking at a particular namespace. It's matching on some metadata object that's inside here. So if it sees an annotation called Mr. T, what it's going to do is going to add an annotation of a cost center with a value of 18. So again, this is an example of that mutating webhook. So all I'm really trying to do here is when I see certain information, maybe cost center is actually missing. And cost center I might use for cost governance inside my particular cluster. I want to be able to add that information back in. Looking at it from just some other examples, and we'll dive deeper into the allowed repos here. So think of that as like whitelist or blacklisting registries. Um, I can do some simple things like not allow conflicting hosts for ingress rules. Uh, I wanna make sure there's labels on objects so I can make sure things have owners. Uh, the other one here around blocking kubectl exec, you can think this is basically blocking the ability to SSH into a pod. So once a workload's actually running inside Kubernetes, I know a lot of organizations look at SSHing. Um, Yes, blocking SSH to the host is one thing, but also blocking SSH access to a pod. So if I can SSH into a pod, I can go, I can look at the process, I can look at environment variables, I can look at the file system. There's a lot of things that I can do. So maybe that's something I also want to block as well. So with that, I'm just gonna quickly hop over to a demo here. Uh, so just quickly, I'm gonna open up this first one here. This is a link uh, looking at all the different libraries. So this is the GitHub repo where Gatekeeper actually sits. We can see here, a lot of organizations are looking in the Kubernetes road around pod security policies. In general, folks are moving away from pod security policies. It's been in beta for a long time. And where it's gonna actually end up in the Kubernetes ecosystem, uh, a lot of folks figure it's gonna end up here in the OPA Gatekeeper world. So now I can look, and here's a bunch of templates and constraints around pod security policies that I can leverage, and this is where the industry is actually moving towards. I look at a lot of general purpose ones. We'll dive deeper into the allowed repos one here, and just have a quick look at the template. So you can see here in this particular template, I'm not gonna go into this in great detail, but you can see all this piece down here. This is that Rego expression and that sample I just showed you. So this is essentially some of that plain text, some of that learning that you need to do from a scripting perspective. But you can see there, it allows me to interject some values. So I can take metadata out of that Kubernetes manifest or the request coming through. And I can use that to interrogate information, look at information. I can also use it to help display error messages or feedback back to the user. So with that here, I'm just gonna quickly show 
Um, I just got a CentOS pod here, so just a small rel image. I'm going to put it into what's called the production namespace. So we're going to what I'm doing here is that CentOS image is just from Docker Hub. So we can see here, this is my production namespace. Once this actually pops up, why am I allowed to pull that particular image into my production namespace? So you can see here, I just got a command prompt. The, this is the equivalent of doing an exec inside a particular container. So again, here I can look at the container. I can see the overall file system. So again, we want to be able to block that. So what can we actually do about that? So looking at that allowed repo constraint template that we just looked at, I'm going to apply that constraint template. So think of that again, just like a template, it doesn't actually put anything in place. It allows me to essentially configure a particular constraint. In this case here, I've called it Kate's allowed repo. This is my production repo, and I'm gonna grant it access to the Kevin GVB uh, registry. You can see here, I'm gonna allow pods, in the production namespace, only coming from a repo that's got Kevin GBB associated with it. So let's actually just run that. So you can see here at the bottom, it's actually created the resource as soon as that comes through. So for folks that are familiar here, we've got some uh, CRDs or custom resource definitions. Obviously everybody in our neighborhood is like fighting over internet right now. Um, and so you can see here we've got those constraint templates and we have that allowed repo constraint that we just put in there. Now let's have a look at that specific ones in the gatekeeper system namespaces where all this is installed to. So what we'll see is that constraint template and then that production repo is Kevin GVB. So there's our particular instance of that template. So now let's actually go and try and run that exact same command again in production, in our production namespace, sorry. So we can see here, we got an error back from the server. So this is that Kubernetes policy or the OPA gatekeeper actually kicking in and denying us actually doing that deployment. Okay, so let's actually go and say, okay, now I'm gonna pull my image from Kevin GBB. So let's go and actually run this one. So we can see here that we got past the first error message where the particular main image, but then I've got a number of sidecar images. So as maybe folks that don't know sidecar, think of that as an additional way to pile additional workloads or additional functionality onto your main workloads. So this monitoring and logging. In this case, this is Linkerd, which is like a service mesh technology for doing MTLS between uh, workloads. So now I'm like, oh, what do I need to do there? So obviously that one pulls from uh, Google Container Registry. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna update my uh, constraint. And you can see down here at the bottom, instead of just Kevin GV, I'm also going to add gcr.io. So I'm going to execute this. It's going to go through. It's going to update that. So now our policy gets updated. I'm going to go through and try that workload again. So again, same thing, that bobblehead application. We can see here that it's actually created. So here, I mean, just to kind of quickly recap, we looked at the ability to how can I actually constrain where I can pull images from and what images I can pull from what registries, even paired right down to a namespace, not the cluster as a whole, but an individual namespace. In this case here, I've allowed images into the production namespace from Kevin GBB registry and then gcr.io container registry. Okay, back over to the presentation. So just wrapping things up, I mean, we went back to the session learning objectives. Hopefully you guys understand what is Kubernetes policy. It's really that OPA gatekeeper implementation. It's really about shifting things left so that now instead of having to build a bunch of things into my particular pipeline and DevOps processes, I can actually have these things adhere to my cluster. So regardless of what channel I come through, uh, whether I'm just doing something directly or somehow I'm able to bypass that DevOps or that automation pipeline, I still have those same controls in place. And again, it's decoupled the implementation from the actual control process. So that's really what you should, you know, care about Kubernetes policy. Uh, so again, allows that governance aspect and then how to apply organizations governance and security controls. So again, 
you guys know your security controls, like I said, the best, the understanding is what can I actually start to leverage and look at for that Kubernetes policy side of the house. So I'll go and I'll create templates and then I'll do instances of those templates, which are the actual constraints. And those are the ones that intercept as part of that admission control pipeline. So again, we're really talking about instead of building a lot of this into and making a very complicated and tightly coupled process, we want to decouple that process. From governance perspective. So session takeaways, a must in any Kubernetes deployment. So again, we just remember that CISO challenge around security's top of mind when it comes to a container strategy. There's multiple ways to accomplish policy. Um, there's still some organizations that build all that on their own logic using developer or using development and code. I do think see a lot of organizations moving towards something like an open policy agent where it's more declarative, it's easier to read, easier to get some information back, back to users. On the other side of the house, similar to what Albert talked about in terms of agile security, don't just adopt what you're doing on-prem. So if you just take the exact same tools, the exact same people, exact same process, and just try and do that exact same thing in cloud, I'm honestly going to say you're going to fail. This is your chance to essentially revisit some of these things, look at the new tooling that's out there, look at those cloud native practices. All those same security holes, security challenges you have on-prem, if you bring the exact same tools and everything to cloud, you're just gonna end up with the exact same challenges. So use this as a chance to make sure you hit the reset button and take the right approach. Security is source control, so treat it like developers treat source code and like infrastructure people as source code. So get into source control, you've got that source of truth, and then figure out how to apply that source of truth across your environment. Uh, use OPA gatekeeper instead of pod security policies like we talked about. And then just in general, leverage that OPA gatekeeper process. So there's a couple of links there around looking at it from the Kubernetes IO perspective, and then that GitHub repo. And with that, I'm gonna hand it back over to Brian.